Welcome to the Feel Strong Fitness Podcast. Fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle programs created for your goals and your reality. No magic pills, no judgments, and no time to waste. Let's get into it. Hey, hello, and welcome to the Feel Strong Fitness Podcast. My name is Justin McClintock. Thank you so much for tuning in, downloading, and pressing all of the buttons to get me in your ears. Today, I'm following up on a social media post we put up recently. I don't remember how recently. Somewhat recently. Entitled, Tools, Not Crutches. I got a lot of interesting responses to this one. And it's something that we really believe, and I wanted to flesh it out a little bit, as well as maybe answer some of the questions, pushback, etc. that I got uh, we are not going to make everyone happy. That's not what we're out for. So tools, what tools are we talking about? Tools around fitness, maybe recovery, things like that. Certainly belts, certainly special shoes, wraps, tape, supplements, chalk. Oh, everyone freaks out. Yeah, chalk. These are all tools that have their place, that have their use. But I strongly believe that it should not be stuff that you use every single time you lift. Briefly, if you can't exercise without X, Y, and Z, without these certain things being present, then it's probably to some degree or other a crutch. It doesn't mean that they don't all have their place. It doesn't even mean that maybe they shouldn't come up at some point in every lifting session. There is a place for all of this stuff, but it is not every time you lift. It is certainly not as you're warming up. It is certainly not when you're going light. There's, there's lots of reasons. So let's flesh it out a little bit. Why would you avoid or hold off using something that gives you some element of a, let's call it a performance edge? The argument is because it's somewhat of an artificial edge. All of these things let you do things you wouldn't otherwise be able to do in, let's say, a, a raw, ungeared, unequipped, unprepared state, which is great and it's an advantage, but it also means that we're, we're bridging a gap of adaptation that you haven't developed yet and we would like you to develop let's get a little bit specific weight belts weight belts are great oh and we should lead from the beginning i own all of these things i use all of these things i own all of the toys there's very little that we don't own and you know when it's appropriate time to time we use all of them we are not like running around just lifting in our loincloth all the time that's not how we roll Weight belts. What do weight belts do? Weight belts do not protect your back. It is not a back brace. Uh, back braces are iffy on protecting your back, but weight belts basically provide you some free core stability. Think of it like another set of abs that you can set on contraction. It gives you something to push against. It will give you added core slash trunk stability while you're moving. Super useful. Our general rule, and this is a general rule, is we don't put on weight belts until we're at least at 80% of a one rep max. This is not a hard and fast rule, and it can go day to day. If I'm working up and I hit, I'm in the 70 somewhere, 72% to make up a number, and I suddenly feel a little unstable, I have a really hard time bracing, enough that it worries me a little bit, that maybe I'm going to collapse, that maybe I'm gonna do something that's not entirely safe, I have a couple of choices. I can drop the weight, try again, try and work on that stability, or I can put a belt on. Either one might be the right choice in a given situation. If I am reliably needing to put a belt on before 80%, that signals to me that I need to do some more trunk stability work on my own. I need to do some dead bugs. I need to do some hollow holds. I need to do some lemon squeezes. I need to do some farmer's carries. I need to do some overhead holds because I do not have sufficient trunk stability to do the other things I want to do. It doesn't mean I'm not strong. It doesn't mean I'm broken. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person, but it means that I am shoring up a weakness much earlier than I would need to, than I should need to. With this 80% rule, if you're listening to this and you're someone who back squats 800 pounds, we probably want to put a belt on a little bit earlier because you are way out at the edges of human uh, possibility and you likely, your structure cannot handle, you know, 500 pounds completely raw. Maybe it can, maybe it should be able to, but that's a whole different realm. I'm assuming most people are back squatting, let's say at most a little over double body weight. 
which is totally impressive. These folks, I think that 80% rule really works and recognize that holding off on that belt and focusing on doing your own bracing and moving really, really well will let you move more weight. It will make you stronger. It will build more core stability. When you put the belt on, you are taking away your ability to adapt your core, your trunk, not everything else, not your legs, not your posterior chain, but your trunk stability is likely not being developed very, very well because that belt is doing it for you. What about shoes, weightlifting shoes? Now, specifically, we're talking about uh, squat shoes or weightlifting shoes, the raised heel with a very stable surface. They're great. Uh, often, basically always used for Olympic weightlifting, certainly also used for squatting. Very useful. What do shoes do? Shoes give you some free ankle mobility. That They provide a very stable surface. Typically, these shoes have a hard plastic or a wooden bottom. No squish at all. So a very stable surface. And they're raised up. So you already have some free ankle mobility on your way down. Advantages. People can get lower without having to really push that ankle mobility. A lot of people are able to stay a little more upright. So when they're catching weights or squatting big weights, they can stabilize better under it. Uh, and certainly the stable surface helps a lot. You'd never want to be weightlifting in like running shoes, squishy marshmallows. That stuff doesn't work at all. So given this, why would you opt to lift not in weightlifting shoes if you can do it safely? Because it will help you develop that full range of motion ankle mobility. If you're lifting in shoes all the time, you are never going to your full range of motion for potential full ankle mobility. Now, if you are someone who is struggling with ankle mobility, you may put on weightlifting shoes all the time because it feels really good. And we'll refer back to where this is going to keep coming up. We'll refer back to the weight belt issue. That's not wrong. And if you're squatting and doing it in weightlifting shoes allows you to stay upright, allows you to work really well, you're getting a huge amount of gains from doing that. You're getting your core stability, you're getting your hips, you're getting your legs, your whole posterior chain, super useful. You are not increasing your ankle mobility. So I would suggest when you're warming up, et cetera, et cetera, as you're going light, as you're getting heavier and heavier, you try and do it without the weightlifting shoes. If you can, I would actually suggest doing it in bare feet, working on that stability, work on being really connected to the ground and making your ankles earn their lunch a little bit. Now, if you can't do this, if you're like Justin, when I try and do this, I can only go, you know, I don't even get to parallel and my torso pitches forward and it's very, very difficult. I hear you. We have clients exactly like you. You need to do some work on your ankle mobility. This doesn't mean we should take your shoes away, but it does mean perhaps you should be working on specifically ankle mobility a couple of times a week. Keep weightlifting in your shoes, or if you don't have shoes, maybe we raise your heels a little bit on some plates or weightlifting wedges or something like that. And both of these can move forward at the same time. None of this stuff means you need to stop training. It does mean you might have some extra work to do if you can't perform without this stuff. I will put an addendum here. If you are, if your job is to be a weightlifter, if your job is to be a squatter, you may want to spend most of your time in competition gear. So maybe you're weightlifting in weightlifting shoes because it moves so fast that that landing surface being different, your heel being flat versus your heel being raised up may be a significant advantage. But if you are someone who's doing this for fitness, for wellness, to look better because it's fun, it's basically a hobby. I do think that lifting and squatting, and I'm including Olympic weightlifting in this, in not weightlifting shoes can be a huge advantage and it will let you build ankle mobility, build strength. You will get better at your overall lifts. You will get better at it when you're in weightlifting shoes because now it will feel even easier. You developed strength at that end range. So now when you go to not end range, you can concentrate on just keeping that big weight overhead or coming up out of the bottom of that squat or whatever it is you're doing. Let's talk wraps. And wraps, we're talking knee wraps, knee sleeves, elbow sleeves, uh, wrist wraps. We're including all of it in this. All super useful. There are many different kinds of wraps and sleeves out there. Generally, they provide some level of compression from light to extremely heavy, especially in like a powerlifting world and things like that. They may limit 
range of motion on purpose, preventing hyperextension or getting tighter and tighter as you flex fully. So as you as you hit that end range of motion, it makes it a little easier to kind of bounce out of it, move out of that range of motion. Uh, all potentially very useful. If you only lift in wraps, sleeves, etc., you are losing some potential gains. You are there's many reasons people end up here. You may be covering up slash working through an injury, which is generally really bad news because you're unlikely to get better and more likely to stay in a vulnerable and inflamed position. Or you may be relying on it because the first time you put on knee wraps, your back squat jumped 30 pounds and you're like, oh, this is great. This made me stronger. I'm going to do this. See the shoes, see the belt. It is a useful, and again, we support using these, but an artificial adaptation that is holding back your overall progress. If you can lift as much as possible without these things, it will be to your advantage. Now, if you are someone who, let's say, let's talk cleaning. If you clean the bar and you're like, oof, my, my left wrist really hurts today. It didn't used to hurt, but I banged it doing something or I had something happen when I was doing handstands and it doesn't feel great today. I'm going to put on a wrist wrap to limit that range of motion just to make sure I'm not hyperextending today. Yeah, 100%. Double high five can also be useful if things are feeling a little banged up. If you had recently something somewhat acute, it will help keep things warm. It will limit that range of motion in a very useful way. And that compression can also be totally healthy. Great. We're talking about chronic use. If you, before you even start your warm up sets, wrap up your elbows and wrap up your knees and wrap up your wrists, I would suggest that you are really missing out on some gains and potentially limiting your progress. You are not letting your tendons as well as your muscles adapt to this full range of motion, adapt to moving this weight, adapt to moving really well with quality. As you warm up, as you get heavier and heavier, they may there may well be an appropriate time to put on wraps, sleeves, etc. But first thing out of the gate probably isn't it, especially if you're doing it all the time. And again, there are appropriate times for this, but the more you can hold off using these tools, the longer you can move really well, chase movement quality, hold yourself to a really high standard and not use these things, you are getting more out of every single rep than you would be otherwise. If you are using wraps, sleeves, etc., because you know you're hurt and it's the only way you can train, if you're not earning money from this, if it isn't your job, I would suggest you need to back off on the weight and volume and very likely pursue a program. I'm not telling you, you need to stop training. You may need to add in some programming to help get you out of pain, to help build up that tendon strength, resilience, etc. to maybe cut down on some of the inflammation if you've developed a tendinopathy or other things, or if it's a muscular problem, figure out what that is, get it assessed and do some work to make that better. Otherwise, you're putting a Band-Aid on it. And if you've been doing this for years, you are just headed to, uh, you know, potentially a career limiting injury, which is no fun at all. So we've talked belts, we've talked shoes, we've talked wraps, kind of going to put tape into wraps. Tape isn't that interesting to talk about. Tape in our purposes, generally gets used. Certainly people tape their wrists, but that's essentially the same as a wrist wrap. Taping your thumbs for hook grip, that's pretty specific. I would put it in the same category. The longer you can make do without it, you will build up some of those calluses, which will help you build up some extra grip strength. So if you can hold off on doing that, though it is a smaller adaptation, uh, if it's painful to you, then taping your thumbs may be the way to go on a somewhat regular basis. Let's get into the two that I expect the most pushback on. We have supplements and we have chalk. Let's leave chalk for last because that seems to make people the most angry, which is always the most fun. Supplements. If you cannot perform without supplements, you're in trouble. Buy supplements. If you cannot go without pre-workout, if you cannot go without a shake before your workout, if you cannot uh, go to sleep without taking a sleep supplement, if you cannot recover without you know, a significant amount of liquid calories, you know, if you're mixing, if you're getting all of your green vegetables in powder form, etc. All of these are totally useful tools. And again, we've used 
all of them. But if you cannot perform without them, you are limiting your adaptation and setting yourself up for some kind of fall off, some kind of significant setback. Certainly pre-workouts, the issues with pre-workouts are pretty well documented. Setting aside the utter dysregulation, non-regulation of the supplement industry, it seems like every 12 to 18 months, another pre-workout gets busted for having some form of uh, meth slash speed in it, you know, a slightly different form of it. That people, you know, it gets popular because for a year, people have been telling other people on message boards, wow, I took this and I've never felt so focused. I've never felt like I had more energy. Yeah, it's because you're on meth. Um, that will make you focused and give you a bunch of energy. It also has lots of nasty side effects that people don't always like to pay attention to. We are big fans of using supplements. We are big fans of sleep supplements. We are big fans of pre-workouts. We are big fans of protein and carbohydrate supplements when it's appropriate. If you can live without it, if you can perform without it, when you use them, they will be even more effective. And this is the kind of thing where we're generally talking not on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not saying, well, let's separate this stuff out. We're not saying that on a day-to-day -day basis, you should decide if you're going to have a protein supplement or not. That may be determined by your macronutrient needs, it may be determined by your workout schedule, your life schedule, how easy or hard it is to get enough protein in your life. We're less worried about protein supplements, certainly for pre-workouts, and even for something as studied and trusted as creatine. At least you want to be cycling this stuff. At least you want to plan out times when you won't be using it. You will build up a resilience to pre-workout and essentially need more and more uh, anyone who, if you know someone who drinks a lot of coffee, who you think of as like the coffee person, they may well drink four, five, six cups of coffee a day, and they don't really feel much of an effect. That just keeps them at baseline, where a person who doesn't drink coffee or drinks one cup of coffee, if they have two or three cups of coffee in a day, they have focus, they have energy, they are ready to go. It's an incredible pre-workout, and we're on record saying that coffee is easily our favorite pre-workout. I still suggest cycling it. Maybe not entirely out of your life. I'm not telling you you need to go caffeine free for four weeks every five to six months. Though if you are able to do that and function, it will be very useful and the caffeine will have a greater effect when you come back to it. I would say if you are putting caffeine in and around your workouts, you should definitely plan on cycling that stuff in and out. It will let it be effective when you need it to be effective, and it will stop you building up a significant resilience to it. It will also, if you're having any, and we're not going to dip our toes too deep in this rabbit hole, but if you're having sort of any adrenal issues, it will help draw that back a little bit. Um, there is some work saying that enormous amounts of caffeine intake can lead to some significant problems, especially if you do it regularly. Creatine, the cycling work, my understanding of the work is a little iffy. Right now, we are opting on the side of it seems best to cycle it out a couple of times a year. Go for two to three weeks without creatine monohydrate, then put it back in your life, five grams a day, carry on. Sleep supplements. This makes people mad sometimes. If we can, we would like to be able to sleep without any aids. It would be great if you could just fall asleep whenever you want for super high quality sleep. We recognize not everyone can do that. Even being able to talk about that idea is potentially speaking from a place of significant privilege. If you cannot sleep without melatonin or ZMA or something a little more potent, if it's possible to cycle that stuff out sometimes, it will potentially give you some great gains. We do not want to wreck your sleep. We do not want to stunt your recovery. If a doctor has told you you should take this to sleep, you should probably take that to sleep. We are not you know, telling you to not do anything a medical professional has told you to do. If you just sort of started taking it and it worked pretty well and you are mindlessly taking sleep supplements and maybe now it helps sometimes but doesn't help all the time, this is a really good thing to think carefully about and address and potentially pull it out or lessen the dose or use it some days but not other days. Um, if you could get away with having not a great night of sleep, if you don't have a lot planned for the next day, that's an okay time to experiment with this stuff. To be really clear, we're just talking about this over-the-counter sleep, sleep supplement stuff. We are in no way dipping our toes into telling you you should not take 
any kind of uh, medication to address your mental health that a medical professional has suggested for you. We are not telling you to get off your meds. Let's talk chalk. This makes people mad because they love their chalk. We love their chalk. If you put chalk on every single time you lift, you are limiting your gains. You are limiting your grip gains. Those grip gains ripple down your arms, down your lats, into your core, your entire stability. You can make huge gains by lifting without chalk. If you chalk up all the time for every single lift, if you're doing it mindlessly, you are missing out on some adaptation you can get from every single rep, whether it's a lift or something on a pull-up bar or something with a dumbbell, whatever it is that you're holding on to, if you do it with clean hands, you will get more out of it than doing it with chalk. Now, as someone who sweats terribly, this is less easy in the summer, less easy when it's really humid. If it's wet and slippery and chalk will make it safer, yeah, use chalk. When deadlifts get really heavy, yeah, you probably want to use chalk. If you're on a competition platform, of course you should use chalk. I would add into this chalk discussion, lifting straps. If you always lift with lifting straps, then you are missing out on some huge gains, especially if it's deadlifting, but, a sp but with shrugs, cleans, if you're one of those people who snatches with straps on, you are really missing out on some grip gains. These are great to use, excellent tools to use, if you're having grip struggles, if you're sweaty and slippery, if your hands hurt a little bit, if you maybe haven't been taking care of your hands the way you should have, and if you're having a hard day and grip just isn't there, that's a great place to use straps. It's a great place to use chalk. But if you can get away without it, you probably should. Chalk becomes one of those magic dust things that people put on for every single time they lift and they just get used to it. We love chalk, we use chalk, we buy chalk, we strongly believe you should use it in specific circumstances and essentially as little as possible. Using lots of chalk, chalk essentially dries your hands out, right? That's how chalk works. Using lots of chalk all the time will actually cause further damage to your hands. If you are someone who has ever torn, whether it's on a lift or a pull-up bar or toes to bar, something like that, there's a pretty good chance you're using chalk. It dries out, and that enormous amount of friction is what can tear your hands up. Good hand care will help prevent this, but excessive chalk use can cause this or certainly contribute significantly toward this. Not using chalk we put in exactly the same category as waiting to put a weight belt on, waiting to put the weightlifting shoes on, waiting to put your sleeves and wraps and belts and all that stuff on. Using chalk is a tool, but it is not something you need for every single lift. I know there are lots of gyms where it essentially has become a cultural thing where people put chalk on for every single lift. If you hold off on it, you will make greater gains, you'll make greater adaptations, and you'll be healthier in the long term by holding off. You will also cause less of a mess, which your gym owner will probably appreciate. I think that's our list of toys and gear for now. We might sum this up by saying the person with the most toys loses, but that's not really true. The All of these things have their place. And we love specific gear, we love specific interventions, we love showing people how to use them in the right moments. The first time, if you ever show someone how to use a lifting strap for the first time, when the bar is being torn out of their hands, and suddenly they can do a little bit of work, they can do those big shrugs, they can do those big rows, because the grip was the only limiting factor, that's an excellent place to use it. If you watch that person strap up, or even go to a mixed grip, Mixed grip is also a adaptation tool that we don't love for every single rep. If you watch them doing it while they warm up, I suggest you stop them and explain what this tool is for. Tools are awesome. The right tool for the job is exactly the right tool for the job. If you let your tools become crutches, you are holding back your adaptation, you are holding back your gains in a significant and important way. Watch out for it. Thank you all so much for tuning in, for listening, for subscribing. I really appreciate all the feedback. I really appreciate uh, any reviews you can give. Written reviews make a very big difference. So however you're listening to this on the Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Play, there's a few out there. 
Uh, if you can leave a written review and drop us five stars, that makes a really big difference. It makes it easier to find this podcast. If you find this useful, please feel free to share it. People have been sharing some of their favorite episodes and we love it. And it's also a great way for us to get in touch with people and kind of spread the good word. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for all your trust and for all your effort. I'm Justin McClintock. Feel strong. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Please visit us at feelstrong.me. Find us on Instagram at feelstrongfit. You can DM us to get started, pick our brain. Rate and review us on iTunes, please. Five stars there makes a really big difference. And folks, remember, we don't work with everyone, but we'll talk to anyone. If you're ready to get started today, so are we. Thank you again, and feel strong.